I just really enjoy the sort of the excitement or the energy and the interest that Compose is bringing to the community. Uh, getting people to talk about this new thing sort of as a collective group and having shared interest, uh, shared learning where we're learning to do something completely new, something completely different from how we've been building UI for the last you know, 10, 11 years on Android. I think there's something really interesting and almost intoxicating about that. It's really been a breath of fresh air for me to sit down at work and, and learn how to start using these APIs and learn how to start building with Compose. And I think that's something that hopefully hopefully will not wear off for a while. And hopefully it just continues making Android feel fresh and modern and interesting for folks that have been doing it for a long time. Hey devs, and welcome back to another episode of the Goobar Podcast, where we talk about building great software and helping others to do the same. In this week's episode, we are talking about the very exciting Jetpack Compose 1.0 release. So stay tuned. After a few quick announcements, we'll jump right into everything that's new and exciting in the world of Jetpack Compose. Hello, devs. Hello. Thank you for tuning in today. Um, it's been a while since we've had an episode of the podcast here. Uh, I know I've had a few people reach out that were sort of wondering what was going on. We're looking forward to new episodes. So for, for those that were, were sort of waiting and, and excited, uh, thank you for, for sitting tight and for, for sharing your, your excitement and interest in more episodes. It's been a particularly busy last, I don't know, six weeks or so for me dealing with some pretty big production issues at work that had to be uh, dealt with. Uh, I had some big uh, workshops that I was preparing for and, and delivering and also just taking some vacation and some time to to recharge and relax a little bit. But I am I am back again. I've got a handful of episodes planned. And with the, the first one here, I'm really excited to chat about a Jetpack Compose. And if you are not familiar, the, the big news in the Android world from this past couple weeks is that Jetpack Compose has finally seen its first 1.0 stable release. Um, in fact, we've actually already gotten a 1.0.1 release, I think, that brings support for one more newer version of, of Kotlin. So, so anyways, very exciting news in, in the world of Android. And while it, it's awesome to, to see the excitement in the community and to see people talking about it and, and giving talks and writing blog posts and all that, I think there's also an element to this that is maybe confusing, especially if you are sort of new to the world of Android or you're just getting into the world of Android, hearing all of this chatter about Jetpack Compose sort of contrasted with so much of the learning material that's still based in the XML world, I, I think that leaves a lot of questions. So to, to kick off today's episode, we're going to talk about what this, this big Jetpack Compose news means for you and your team. And then I'm going to share some of my thoughts and, and my experience so far in working with Compose. And then uh, we'll round it out at the end with some useful resources to help you get started and also chat just briefly about sort of what's coming next and the Compose roadmap. So what does Jetpack Compose 1.0 mean for you and your team? Well, you might ask, do you have to start using Jetpack Compose today? And today, and to that, I would say no. You definitely do not need to start using Jetpack Compose today. And in fact, for pretty much any existing project, it's just not going to be feasible to completely rewrite your app and compose overnight. And that's going to be something that takes a lot of time. So, so no, you don't need to immediately start using Jetpack Compose today. Related to that, you might wonder, is Jetpack Compose even stable enough to consider for your app? And given that we've now got this uh, stable 1.0 release, I would say probably. 
Uh, we haven't run into any significant issues on on my team so far in developing with Compose. I know other folks and other teams that have been building with Compose for months now and been very happy with it. So I think it's definitely safe to consider it uh, stable enough to at least try and to consider it for your particular use cases and see what the stability is like for you. Another question I think that is probably at the top of a lot of folks' mind right now is whether it's a good time to start learning Jetpack Compose for Android. And to that, I would say definitely. There's a lot of good learning resources out there coming from Google. The developer community is certainly embracing Compose and putting out lots of content related to it. And now that the APIs have stabilized quite a bit, I think we're going to see a little bit less churn in the the blog posts and the talks and the documentation and code labs and such. So it'll be a little bit easier, I think, to start learning and not have to sort of relearn how to do things every couple of months. So definitely a good time to start learning Compose. Now, do you need to know Jetpack Compose to get a job today? To that, I would say no. I think because so because Compose is so new to so many uh, developers and to so many teams, I don't think a lot of folks are going to be requiring that for a job today. Uh, there might be some teams, but hopefully those teams are, are willing to, to teach folks since it again is so new. So I wouldn't say that you have to know Compose to, to get a job, although it might help you get a job. If, if teams are looking to invest in Compose and they're interviewing someone that has experience with it, that might be a point in their favor. So something for you to consider. Now, let's say you're building a new app. Uh, should you build that new app using only Compose? Uh, I would say not necessarily to that, though I personally would go that route as much as possible. You know, you can't do everything that you can do in XML with Compose quite yet. And, and some things might not be quite as performant yet, or there might be certain particular types of uh, APIs or whatnot that just aren't quite available or aren't quite ready for your use case. So it's hard to say that you could build any and, and every application fully in Compose today. I think that's probably not the case. But for most basic apps, uh, I think it's definitely a valid way to go. And like I said, for me, uh, really enjoying Kotlin and really enjoying Compose so far, I would try and use as little XML as possible like in, uh, while building my Android apps. And then uh, finally, sort of in this realm of big questions that I think people are asking right now, uh, can you integrate Jetpack Compose into your existing application if you want to start using it? Or do you have to sort of go all or nothing? And, and to this, the answer is most definitely yes, absolutely 100%. You can choose to integrate Compose into single screens in your app or even just single views. If you, if you really wanted to, you could have a single button in your application be drawn with Compose. I, I don't know that I would recommend going that route, uh, but, you, but you could. There's a sort of a lot of valid ways of integrating Compose into your application, which does make it really flexible to think about adopting it for, for your team and for your current production code base. So with that, I want to share a little bit about my experience so far with Compose. And, and spoiler alert here, I really like Compose. So this is gonna be probably biased to that uh, opinion a little bit, so just fair warning. Uh, but I've, I've been following Compose very closely since it was first announced at Android Summit in, in 2019. I was there at Android Summit. Um, I, along with I think pretty much everyone else that was there was really excited about the announcement and I immediately sort of downloaded the Android uh, 4, um, or excuse me, I downloaded the Android Studio 4.0 um, uh, preview build and, and started playing with Compose, started going through the, the first couple code labs and examples they had, and just immediately was, was really impressed. I, I remember particularly being really excited about the idea of, of previews for my composables and for being able to create multiple previews all sort of in one preview window and in one file and being able to view previews for maybe a small phone and a, and a large phone and for dark mode and light mode i just found that really exciting 
in, in addition to just the, the type safe nature, everything being built in Kotlin, no XML, I, I immediately thought it had a lot of potential and was very excited to see where it went. Since then, um, I hadn't done a lot with Compose. I had followed it closely, watched, you know, videos and, and listened to podcasts and read blog posts, but I wasn't doing a lot of active building with it. I, I would try it maybe every six months or so just to kind of touch base, kind of redo the basic code lab again and and then sort of put it back on the shelf. But as we started getting closer to this 1.0 release, um, particularly sort of with, with Google I.O. and getting more of a timeline around the idea that we would have a, a 1.0 stable coming um, in July, I really wa was excited again and, and renewed that excitement. And uh, in addition to that, I think my, my team uh, for my main project also was really excited with that. And so we sort of got together, we weighed sort of pros and cons, we, we weighed the, the risks, and we looked at the type of work that we had coming down the pipe, which was very sort of design heavy and design focused. And we felt that it would be a very interesting idea to try and bet on Compose um, to, to at least try it out, see if there's any issues. And if not, to go ahead and, and think about doing some of our, our new app redesign work using Compose. So for the last couple of months, we, we've been doing that. And so far, I think the results have been very positive. Um, there's been learning curve, definitely. Uh, but I think the learning curve has been very reasonable. And, and I think uh, some would say it's been maybe a little bit harder than expected. Some would say it's been a little bit easier than expected. But I but I don't think it's been extremely difficult. Uh, any Anyone on my team that's listening to this and feels differently, uh, feel free to, to contradict me. No worries there. But uh, yeah, I think it's been an overall very positive experience. Um, and I know, again, kind of spoiler alert, jumping to the end here for me personally, um, I find myself not wanting to build UI in, in XML anymore. And even additionally, I find myself not wanting to teach Android using XML anymore because I find Compose so much easier to get up and running. Uh, the, the great example is for a list, trying to teach Android and, and show developers how to get items, uh, list items onto a screen using Recycler View is so much more complex than it is with with compose and so i think compose actually really lowers the barrier to entry for people wanting to jump in to android development in a lot of ways uh, so I, I keep talking about how much i like compose let's talk a little bit about what i like particularly so i love that we are building ui with kotlin i love that we don't have xml for our layouts it's sort of one less language to be building with extensively. Uh, certainly we still have XML in our Android project for resources and, and whatnot, but not having to build all of the UI in XML really cuts down on the amount of XML we're, we're writing. So it's sort of just one less syntax to consider, which again, for new developers, I think is particularly important. I, I like that I'm, I'm using a language that I'm comfortable with. I, I know how to express my ideas and my thoughts using Kotlin. So I feel like that translates well into manipulating the, the UI using all of these declarative APIs. Um, another really, really big thing that I'm enjoying about Compose is the theming. I feel like theming has always historically been so difficult on, on Android or so confusing. And I think the fact that all of the sort of material components pull from the material theme in, in ways that make sense. Uh, we have sort of sensible defaults for, for typography, for uh, the, the shapes and the like corner radiuses and such, and colors in particular, that I think it makes it really easy to sort of understand the expectations around how a component is going to be colored, um, how to configure the theme, um, how to configure your typography. And, uh, and, and I also think it makes it really easy to, to extend and kind of customize the, the themes and the typographies and everything based on your own team or your app or your company's design guide. And um, so far, I'm, just, I'm finding it very, very intuitive to work with, and I'm finding it very easy to sort of get things onto the screen and get them looking nice and you know very close to what we have in the design very, very quickly. 
Um, I'm going to do another episode on Compose probably for next week that'll talk about some particular tips around theming that I have found particularly useful. Uh, but yeah, su suffice it to say that I've really enjoyed how theming is working in Compose. It just, it makes sense to me. And, and I actually, ironically, I feel like theming in XML is making more sense to me now after uh, after working more with the, the theming system in, in Compose. So if anyone else has had that experience, I'd be curious to to hear about it as well. Maybe you leave a, leave a comment on social media or anything. Uh, I'd be curious about chatting, um, see what other people think. Another thing that I really enjoy about Compose is the, the self-documenting nature of the APIs. Because everything is in Kotlin and it's all type safe, I feel like it's really easy to sort of discover how to work with a particular API or how to configure a particular API. I had this experience a couple of days ago when using a, a text field to get uh, input from a user and configuring the, the soft keyboard and configuring sort of the, the action state and listening to sort of the, the done action on the keyboard was incredibly easy to do with Compose and it was really easy to discover. I ended up not even needing to go and search through the, so the online documentation because I was able to click in to sort of the parameters of, of the text field and eventually discover how to do what I wanted. And it, it just feels so intuitive to me. And I think if you're if you're working in Compose, it really is beneficial to get into that habit of if you have a question on how to do something, let's say with a with an app bar, click into the the composable functions and explore the parameters and see what types of configuration you can do with them. What parameters do they take? What sort of predefined types can you pass in? Um, I when, in my experience, I found that a lot of times you can un figure out how to do something simply by sort of poking around it, it the the type system which is really really awesome um i mentioned before that when i first tried compose one of the things i was really drawn to was the uh the previews for for your composables and, and i still feel that way being able to make a quick change in my composable function and then quickly see that change reflected in my preview is, is pretty powerful, especially for rapid development, rapid prototyping, really, really helpful. There are some challenges potentially with, with build times that I'll talk a bit later, but, but yeah, I'm really excited about previews. I'm excited about being able to configure previews for, for different, you know, device sizes or, or themes. Uh, the fact that they're sort of pre-built device sort of configurations for your preview so you can have a preview that looks like it's running on a, on a pixel 3 for example or or a pixel 5 i think that's really cool as well sort of uh, emulate sort of the idea of seeing what it would look like if you ran it on different emulators but all just within the the preview functionality which is really cool I mentioned that there are several viable approaches for integrating into an existing application i think that's huge being able to have certain screens that are nothing but compose, having other screens where it's maybe a, a fragment that's content is drawn using compose, or having other screens yet that might be largely XML with just bits of compose sprinkled in. I think having all of these options on the table makes it really easy for teams to consider using this and makes it not an all or nothing approach. And I think that's going to be really huge for Compose and for the adoption of it, because I think teams will be encouraged to try it here and there and might be able to start jumping on the Compose bandwagon sooner than they would have if it was more of an all or nothing thing. If, if your entire screen had to be a, entirely Compose, I think that would be a large or a much larger sell to folks. But, but since it's not... I think we can try it more quickly and hopefully that will lead to more people enjoying it. Um, another thing here, again, as I'm just going down this long list of things that I like about Compose, is that Compose has integrated really nicely into our sort of application architecture that we developed. And in fairness, our team 
spent a lot of time trying to develop sort of an MVVM style architecture that would work in a Compose world. So some of that is just a credit to the team behind that work and being able to design something that would support Compose, but also just the fact that Compose itself, it, it can sort of slot in and work with a very MVVM based approach. It can work sort of where the, the composables themselves are maintaining state, uh, but but again, it, it doesn't sort of come in and just dictate that you have to build your apps a particular way. There's some flexibility there, which I really like. And uh, the, the last thing that I'll add here, and this one's hard to quantify or even really describe concretely, but I just really enjoy the sort of the excitement or the energy and the interest that Compose is bringing to the community, uh, getting people to talk about this new thing sort of as a collective group and having shared interest, uh, shared learning where we're learning to do something completely new, something completely different from how we've been building UI for the last you know, 10, 11 years on Android. I think there's something really interesting and almost intoxicating about that. It's really been a breath of fresh air for me to sit down at work and, and learn how to start using these APIs and learn how to start building with Compose. And I think that's something that hopefully hopefully will not wear off for a while. And hopefully it just continues making Android feel fresh and modern and interesting for folks that have been doing it for a long time. So I just rattled off a bunch of likes and in all honesty, like I said, I really do like Compose. So it makes sense that my list of likes would be pretty long. A few things that I do dislike or or just maybe don't love quite as much. So the first being that leading up to this stable release, tooling was, was a challenge at times. Sometimes things would break uh, Android Studio or, or you might need particular plugin versions or particular dependency inversions that everything would need to match up. Um, Kotlin versioning was also a challenge. You kind of have had to make sure that you were on the particular version of Kotlin that would work with Compose. And and I think I think now with the the latest like dot release that just went out after the the one release, I think now we're up to supporting Kotlin one dot five dot two one or something. So we're pretty darn recent on supporting the newest version of Kotlin there. Um, but but that was a pain in a while. But but again, now that now that we're at a 1.0 stable release, now that Arctic Fox is stable as well, I suspect that that's all going to settle way down, which will be great. Another thing, kind of in the dislike column here, is performance. Um, this is something that a, a coworker has been doing some really interesting work into, and and I will be. He's planning on publishing a blog post here very soon, which I think will be really interesting to, to see people's feedback on and, and to share um, our findings. But what we have found is that there is a little bit of a performance hit when using Compose as opposed to uh, just pure XML. It's, it's pretty small in the grand scheme of things. Uh, we're talking... Uh, just very, very minimal, maybe an extra couple of frames um, potentially to to get to like first initial render time on screens and, and maybe slightly slower again just on, on each sort of draw. Um, so it, it's something that we, we've noticed a bit of a, a slowdown, but nothing significant. We're, we're not uh, deterred from continuing to use Compose in this sense. And frankly, the fact that it's even so close on its initial release, I think is pretty impressive. And, and we'll talk about the roadmap here in a bit, but performance is at the top of the Compose roadmap. So I suspect that all of that will um, actually improve quite a bit over time. So while it's in the dislike column right now, I suspect that it will not be in the dislike column for, for very long, which I think will be great. And the last thing that I'll throw in my dislikes here is rebuild times for, for previews. So anytime that you want to regenerate your preview, you need to sort of, you need to rerun a, a particular Gradle task um, to, to recompile some of your code and to be able to, to regenerate and re-render your preview. And depending on how your project is structured, this might 
actually be a really slow thing to do. If you have a project that's completely in one single module or it you are, are working with a preview that just happens to be in one big module, even if the overall project is multi-module, if you have a lot of Kotlin code that you need to recompile, this can be uh, this can be a pain, especially if you don't have you know caching and whatnot in place, and you're having to redo a lot of work for for your task. So that can be a drawback. Again, there's ways to to work around this, I think, and I'll talk about that in in my next episode where I'm talking about tips for Compose. Um, but uh, but yeah, just uh, something to to consider there, something to be aware of. So then, um, we're going to start to wind it down here, but if you have not started Compose yet and you're wondering about resources for, for learning about Compose or to uh, make Compose sort of easier to learn or, or more functional and more powerful from you, uh, I have a, a handful of useful things to share. The first being the, the Code Labs um, Google's gotten really good with their code labs as a means of sharing examples these days. And in particular, they have an entire sort of learning plan for, for uh, Compose that has lots of different code labs in there and even some documentation and whatnot. So I think that's a really powerful place to start, to uh, basically start at the beginning, start going through those code labs, building up your, your knowledge, building up sample apps um, as you go with Compose. I think it's a really good way to learn. Uh, I've done that. My, my team has sat down and done code labs together. It's really helpful. There is also, I think, a lot of value, like I said, in simply exploring the code itself, clicking into APIs, really sort of diving into some of the internals to a lot of these composable functions. I think that also really helps give some insight in how to structure your, your own composable functions and, and help sort of designing the APIs that your team might use for anything that's gonna get reused across your application. So yeah, highly recommend digging into the just the existing Compose code. There is a, a, a really helpful site. I'm not sure how up to date it is, but I mean, the few things I've clicked on still seem to be pretty relevant, but uh, uh, Joe Birch created a site called Compose Academy that I have found really helpful in the past for giving very specific examples on, to, on how to do particular things in Compose, like drawing something to the screen or showing text on the screen or showing like a list. Uh, so, so Compose Academy is a really helpful site to, to just take a few minutes at the very least and just poke around and get a sense for what Compose looks like. Um, I'll, I've got a, a link to it in the show notes as well as all these other resources, so you can check it out there. But I think it's it's worth a, a peek at the very least. Um, something uh, I was pretty interested to see earlier this week was a, a new sort of app released to Google Play by the, the Material Design team, I think. Um, but it's the Compose Material Catalog app which is basically just an Android app that you can download and install that has examples of all the kind of common material components and some of the patterns you can use with them. And it's interesting, I think, it's just a, an example of what some of these components look like and then being able to see all of them in a single place and actually interact with them. It also could be really helpful to maybe share with a design team and show them, hey, these are the types of things that we can do really easily with sort of default components you know, which of these can we reuse in our designs and what things might we need to do in a little bit more custom way. But I think it's a good place to start having a conversation with uh, design teams if you're going to be adopting Compose for your project. And the, the last resource I want to share here is a library called Accompanist, which is kind of like support libraries for Compose. It basically provides some additional sort of APIs and functionality that haven't made their way into sort of the main Compose APIs yet, um, but that are still really helpful. So some examples of this are sort of a, a swipe to refresh functionality or the ability to navigate to a, a bottom sheet, for example. That was, I think, just added th this past week. Um, so there's a handful of useful things in there that I think, I, I imagine my team in particular, I think there's already a couple things we've identified that we, we might want to start using there. So 
uh, I would encourage you to just check those out. See if there's anything that catches your eye and that you might be able to use in, in your project. All righty. So the, the last thing I want to talk about here, and then we'll, we'll get out of here and call it on this episode, is just want to touch briefly on, on the Compose roadmap. So what, what's next for, for Jetpack Compose or, or Compose in, in general? And I'm going to have links to the to the roadmap in, in the show notes again, so you can take a look yourself. But I think the, the interesting thing here is, one, just that there is this fairly detailed roadmap available. So it shows where the, the team at Google is, is thinking about taking Compose, what they're focused on. And then also, I think it's helpful to know maybe what they don't have prioritized so high right now. But uh, if, you, if you look at this Jetpack Compose roadmap, the, the first thing on the list is performance, which I think is great. And there's a number of sort of performance items uh, down below when they start talking about specific things, things like sort of async, um, let's see where to go, a async drawing um, sticks out to me. Um, there's a number of different sort of lazy sort of collections or different lazy APIs that will likely be helpful. Improved preview performance is another one that I'm particularly interested in given some of my complaints around preview times. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and additionally, adding more sort of components, particularly material U components, looks like it's in focus for um, sort of the, the current, I don't know if it's sprints or whatever, but between now and probably, you know, like the next major releases. Um, so this will be awesome. And, you know, having more support for these, these components that make it easier and easier to sort of bring and realize material design in our apps with Compose, I think that'll be really helpful to developers. Um, and, and among many, many thing, other things on this roadmap, there's also some call out for improvements to large screens. Um, I'm curious about this one. I think uh, I, I've seen a lot of questions and, and they're questions that my team has been looking at as well on how to support large screens, how to support different screen sizes and configurations, um, and especially with things like foldables coming up um, and starting to become more of a thing. I, I just think more support in this area will be really interesting and be very welcome. So I'm curious to see what they have coming down the pipe for that. There's a lot more here in the roadmap. I'm not going to go through and read every item line by line, but I, I do encourage you to go check it out. And again, like I said, the, the link for that will be in the show notes. And the one last thing I'll say, and it's not on the sort of the Jetpack Compose roadmap, but more on the Compose multi-platform story. But this, this week, sort of after this 1.0 of, of Android's Jetpack Compose, uh, Kotlin sort of more general Compose multi-platform has gone into its first alpha. Uh, if you're not familiar, sort of Compose multi-platform is sort of this idea of taking the same APIs that we're using for Compose on Android and being able to use those APIs and then, you know, maybe other similar APIs for building a UI for um, desktop or for a web using Kotlin multi-platform. Uh, so this is this is really interesting. It's very early days still, I think, here, but it is possible to to load up, let's say, IntelliJ or now even Android Studio, thanks to this new Compose multi-platform plugin that's now available, and to be able to start actually building desktop applications using Compose for the UI and then using Kotlin for any of your sort of business logic or uh, other code. This is something that I, I haven't really tried yet, but I'm planning to soon. And when I do, I'll likely, you know, share some more about it. But it's pretty interesting to, to see this evolution as well. So we'll, we'll kind of have two parallel tracks here. We'll have Jetpack Compose for Android evolving. Um, but then there's also going to be sort of these other places where Compose is going to become an option. And it'll be interesting to see if there's any traction for that. It's kind of a, it's a, it's a little bit of a different story, I think, than the Android side. So I'll, I'll link to a blog post about Compose Multi-Platforms Alpha in the show notes, and you can read more about it. And uh, yeah, we'll probably we'll dedicate an episode to it in the future just to, to explore some of the ideas and what it might mean for the Kotlin Multi-Platform development story. If anyone has tried this, uh, I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts have been so far. And with that... I think we will go ahead and call this episode. 
So like I said, super excited about Jetpack Compose and this 1.0 and, and these stable APIs. I'm really curious to hear what other people are thinking about this. If, if anyone has been using Compose in production or are just excited and been using it for your own projects, uh, let me know. Leave a comment on, on social media or if you're watching this on, on YouTube, leave a comment on, on the YouTube video. Um, but very curious to, to hear who's using it and enjoying it and also maybe who's used it and is not enjoying it. And, and if not, I'd be really curious to know why. I think that's really interesting and, and important to highlight those thoughts and comments as well. Uh, hopefully this has been interesting. Hopefully it's been helpful. If you weren't sure what to think about Compose and this new big release, I will catch you all in the next episode, which like I said, will hopefully be tips on using Compose. So stay tuned for that. And I hope you all have a great day, a week until next time. <laughs>